Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Putin's hybrid war and the fact that it includes foreign assassinations. Our guest for the show is Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar and much more. So we will discuss today assassinations, assassinations in Europe, and more recently, assassination attempts here in the US. We need to examine what happened and the connection between the two, if any. Welcome to the show, Gene. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Jay. So what's happening here in terms of assassinations? Let's look at last weekend first. Let's look at, at the forces that brought all those events together and that um, allowed an, a lone terrorist, so to speak, that's what we know so far, um, to attack Donald Trump. The whole picture and the data is not totally in, so I'm going to go off on a little limb here based on past uh, research and past uh, events. This assassination attempt uh, appears to have been carried forward by what we call a lone wolf and technological terrorist. And what do I mean by that? Well, a colleague of mine, Jeffrey Simon, has written a book on it, and he's the one that came up with the theory. And what it does is it takes a single individual, or sometimes two individuals working together, like Tim McVeigh and his sidekick, um, to come up with an individual uh, plot to um, assassinate or bomb. This young man had bombs as well, it appears. And I don't know what he was planning to do with that, but he fits the profile. Um, he's young, he's single, he's been bullied, he has access to uh, weapons of mass destruction, and uh, he has some social issues. Um, we can't really say definitively that he has mental problems, but it takes a singular obsession to do what he did. So what he did first is textbook. He went to the site a couple of times, they're reporting this, prior, and cased it. Uh, looked around, saw what he needed to do. Then he went out and bought the things he needed, including a ladder. And uh, he practiced with his gun. Then he arrived at the site three hours early. And he was walking around and he did arouse the suspicions of the police. However, not sufficiently for them to actually intervene in any way with him. And then we know the rest of the story, how we went on the roof how the uh, sheriff's deputy went up on the roof and found that he really wasn't prepared to confront him. And then I guess sparked by all of this interest, he turned around and probably prematurely uh, executed what he intended to do. But this theory of lone wolf terrorism uh, is available in a book by my friend. And the book is called Lone Wolf Terrorism, Understanding the Growing Threat. This was written many years ago. And don't listen to people who say there's no such thing. There definitely is such a thing, and it definitely is a prominent part of us. But it's also happened previously in history. Assassination, it turns out, is one of the weapons that terrorists use and was first used in Russia in the late 19th century uh, by anarchists. And this, of course, ultimately resulted in World War I because it was an anarchist who assassinated the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, Hungary, and Sparta. The first world war. Well, what about the the family here? You know, I'm always interested when, in in these uh, assault rifle attacks to see what was going on in the family. And in this case, we know that the the family had a number, dozens actually, of these uh, assault weapons at home. And the assault weapon that this kid used was one of those weapons. It was taken from his father's collection of weapons. So, hmm, query, uh, I, I don't know if the press has, has gone to this point, but did the father know that he took the weapon? Did the father know uh, what he had in mind or, you know, connect the dots on what he might do? Was the father, the family involved? And if so, shouldn't, shouldn't they be held accountable? Well, again, going by the recent reports in the media, uh, the father and son did actually practice shooting together. The son, one, one thing they... They had uh, that bonded them, I presume. Um, the other thing is that particular day, he knew his son was going to go to the gun club and practice. And he actually called the police uh, when the son didn't return home. Uh, as far as the um, environment and the family is concerned, we don't know anything. We can't really 
hold parents responsible for anything. Um, I'm sure there's hardly a family in the United States that doesn't have members who they dearly wish did not engage in the um, actions and, and obsessions that, that they do. Everyone has, uh, you know, problem kids. And uh, we can't say definitively that uh, this young man, um, that his parents were at all aware of his proclivities and propensities. The old rule, the, the common law rule was that a parent was responsible for the torts of his children. Um, I don't know if there was an age attached to that, and I don't know the exceptions to that, but it just seems to me that um, that would be one way we could limit these events. In any event, so what we learn from this in terms of the environment for violence, the environment for assassination, um, the notion that uh, assassination is uh, something that can happen, even with a very uh, tough guy like Trump? Um, and, and what is the connection, if any, um, between what happened here last weekend against Trump and what happened um, against the CEO of the weapons manufacturer in Germany recently? In that case, that was a nation state, um, you know, organized uh, assassination, but an assassination nevertheless. Uh, is this a kind of virus that's going around and what, what is what is the connection? What's happening domestically and what's happening globally, um, you have to be very careful about the parallels you draw, but it, but what's happening domestically is happening in the context of what's happening globally. And just to digress for a moment on the theory of what's happening globally, we have had in the modern age since the late 19th century a succession of terrorist waves. Uh, the scholar uh, David Rappaport, uh, who's a great terrorism scholar, explained all of this. It was his theory. There were four waves up through uh, the Islamic terrorist wave recently, the religious terrorism wave. And, and he was uh, thinking about what might succeed that, what might come afterward, because it was going to peter out in the 2020s, which it has more or less. And um, he thought it was going to be what we're seeing now, which is uh, a rise in um, maybe what we would call authoritarian terrorism. But in this case, it breaks the paradigm because in previous cases, these have been asymmetric groups. Now we have states who actually um, proxy out or find proxies that are asymmetrical. And this is what's happening with Russia and Europe. You know, um, revenge is the name of the game in terms of people who believe that uh, power and might make right. And Putin is one of those strong men who does. And, and also Iran. We've had a threat against uh, Trump from Iran just recently for assassinating. Trump assassinated um, Soleimani, their, the head of, of their Revolutionary Guard. And uh, they've been calling for revenge ever since. So you have state-sponsored uh, terrorism, and we know Israel ha has engaged in this also. And uh, Putin himself is now, for the first time of it, since he invaded Ukraine, um, seeking a revenge uh, for uh, our, uh, Ukraine's pushback against Russians invasion and for our furnishing weapons for them to use in Crimea and to make strikes within Russia itself. This is why we've gone so carefully. So what he's been doing, apparently, which of course he's not admitting to, the NATO nations though have come, come up with the idea that yes, there is something going on. There have been a series of arsons in uh, facilities, uh, transportation, industrial facilities, and there have been uh, assassination attempts against emigres, Russian emigres, uh, against uh, opposition figures. One of Navalny's uh, chief aides uh, was there was an assassination attempt against him in Lithuania, for example, and somebody was killed in Poland. Uh, so they're really upping the temperature here. And what they've been engaged in, they've been using local actors because their own intelligence agents are now being monitored by European countries. And they've been using these local actors who are appearing to be lone wolves, but they're not. 
So you have to be really careful when you draw your parallels and what you're working with. Yes, it is state-sponsored terrorism, which it is not in the case of the Trump attempt. It is um, uh, the youth. Uh, it is facilitated by looking like lone wolf terrorism, but it's not. But there, there have been uh, a number of things. And why is he doing this? Um, and, and even threats, by the way, against. Uh, American bases and American servicemen in Europe. He wants to stay below the NATO radar. He wants to stay below the threshold of sparking Article 5 of NATO, which calls for an attack on one nation by an enemy for all of the allies of that nation victim uh, to respond to the enemy. We don't want to be sparking uh, a hot war here. So, uh, they're not, they're, they're not only using proxy states like Iran. Russia is not only using proxy states like Iran to uh, mess up things in, in the Middle East, but uh, they're using actual proxy loans in Europe to strike back at Europe in revenge for arming Ukraine. And they're trying to intervene. The biggest um, plot was foiled recently against Germany's most important maker of arms and furnisher of ammunition uh, to Ukraine. Ukraine has badly needed ammunition. This is uh, Rhine Metal, is the name of his country, and his name is uh, Papager. And uh, there, there was a plot that was interrupted uh, to kill him. And there have been recent uh, attempts, uh, plots, less specific against other weapons suppliers in different European countries. There have been a number of these things happening in the last six months. It's really taxing NATO. And at the recent meeting of NATO in Washington, or was it New York, um, they really got together and started thinking, how are we gonna regard this? Is this really something we wanna invoke NATO for? How do we wanna respond? How can we respond? How can they respond? What can they do? I mean, it's, it's the civilized versus the uncivilized. Uh, they're not going to do their own campaign for assassinations in Russia. I mean, uh, uh, well, it seems justified, but it, it's not civilized. Um, so query, what are their options? I'm not the person to answer that. And I don't think any one person can answer that. Uh, I do know that a number of high profile military people in the United States, such as Wesley Clark, have been calling for the United States to beef up its military supplies and uh, ships, ammunition, drones, uh, to prepare, in other words, because we really are in uncharted territory here. And we have to study very carefully what's happening and come together in a unified way to decide how to respond. Of course, one way <laughs> we could respond, and it seems so obvious, is to further support Ukraine, which is really fighting. They, they are the tip of the spear. I mean, people have been saying since the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine that Russia's real objective, and Poland is the one that normally says this, uh, is to um, take over hegemony over Europe. And that if Ukraine fails, the next step is they're going to attack the Baltic states and Poland. And others say, oh, no, no, no. It's only because we've threatened them by beefing up NATO. Uh, <laughs> well, it seems that aggression from Russia doesn't need us to beef up NATO because as a result of that aggression, we have two new NATO members right on the frontier of Russia, which is not a, a, which is not a good consequence for Russia. So that argument is a little bit specious. And I do believe after studying uh, Putin's speeches and uh, since 2009, that he has a plan, a vision for overturning Western hegemony and leadership and basically installing his, his own with Russia and changing the whole world economy and politics. And if, no, he, needs, if he needs to use assassination to do this, he will do it. You referred to um, you know his attempt at the CEO of that German we weapons company as vengeance, but um, would you entertain the thought that vengeance might have been part of it, but the other part of it is he wants to 
discourage and intimidate Germany and that company from providing further weapons in the future. And that's part of a war. That's part of an asymmetric war. Uh, you somehow undermine their resolve to provide weapons to Ukraine, and you achieve a lot that way. Uh, it's, so I'm wondering if it's um, you know vengeance or prevention or both. Yes, uh, scholars and leaders in Europe are calling this part of Russia's hybrid war against NATO. So they recognize it as a war. Uh, as to what to call it, they have different ideas about what to call it. But they're linking it with interruptions in internet service, of internet attacks, which has taken place in Estonia. Um, in fact, the Estonian prime minister is now um, has been targeted by Russia as a as a criminal and uh, marked for um, action if if she uh, bear, if she steps out of Estonia. So they've been very aggressive. Uh, you know, the, the hallmark of strongmen is, I think, to overturn the rules that keep order in the world because number one, chaos benefits them. Then they can come in and take the reins of power, aggregate it to themselves, and impose whatever kind of order they want in response. Mm -hmm. But what they do is they overturn the moral order, the political order, the institutional order. And, and to them, um, it, it breaking the rules is part of the game and how you get ahead. That sounds hauntingly similar to what Trump is doing. You know, uh, I'm thinking of Churchill, you know, the gathering storm. Uh, it was different then in the 30s, but there were similarities too. Um, you know, the winds of war are blowing all over Europe and uh, we are either in or soon to be involved in in a war, uh, you know, broad, broad violence in Europe. It, you can argue that it came from the Russian invasion or, or it came from the Middle East or it came from the migrants um, or it came from the terrorists, but it's there and it's happening. And, you know, the, the question, I suppose, is uh, why do we have so much of this? Just a, a couple of days ago, there was a strange, what appeared to be a poisoning of six people uh, in Bangkok, Thailand, um, in the Grand Hyatt there, American Hotel. Um, and uh, some, some of them, they were Vietnamese, some of them, but they were American Vietnamese and they were poisoned as a group in the hotel, six of them. And so you wonder, you know, whether we are in a time when assassination, poisoning, high-tech weapons, hacking, what have you, it's all fair game. Um, and so in the US, I'm really wondering how Trump uses this lone wolf terrorist attack politically. It seems he certainly is. He's using all the tools on the road to fascism. Um, and this, you know, there's a parallel, at least to me, between his use of these fascism tools and the tools that Putin is using for the hybrid war uh, in Europe. Your thoughts? One of the most effective weapons of a hybrid war, which basically is a war where you don't want uh, a kinetic uh, inflamed war, an actual ground war. Uh, so you substitute other means that may be even more effective than a ground war, such as uh, getting your uh, changing the narrative about who's the friend and who's the enemy, who's good and who's evil. And this is the main thing. Um, when you're trying to change, when you're trying to institute a new order of things, uh, and I see that happening with the Dem with the uh, Republican Party, um, Trump started out with a movement called MAGA, and that movement has now basically hollowed out and uh, replaced uh, the functionaries in the Republican Party and has cowed the others into. Um, their acquiescence. And this is what we also expect from social psychology experiments, that if you don't join them, at least you're gonna let them be and stand aside. You think of Nikki Haley and Marco Rubio, uh, the standard barrier bearers of the GOP previously and how they've fallen into line. Or you look at um, Cheney and, uh, and uh, uh, Kissinger 
and uh, Milt Romney and, and others that are persona non grata now uh, who have stood aside, they haven't resisted. And you would expect 65% of the people in a population or cohort to either stand aside or collaborate. And that's what's happening. And that's how democracy is overtaken by a unified, um, aggressive, coercive, power-hungry movement. Now, and, and all of this takes place with a whole band-aid over it of propaganda. Propaganda is essential. Back to hybrid war. Changing the narrative is so important. So watch, watch in the next few weeks after this assassination attempt, after Trump got up there and said, fight, 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 and you have that iconic photograph. That is absolute gold when it comes to changing a narrative. And you think, is this man changing from being the um, purveyor of alternative facts? Uh, is he changing because he's had this life-changing experience? I don't think so. Um, he is changing to, uh, he's changing the narrative and he's changing his role. It's a script that they write. And in this, under this script, you unify. And those that don't, don't come under your tent, they're fair game. They, they become the outliers, they become the targets. And that's how a fascist regime gets into power and overpowers democracy. So, um, you know, Biden knows what's going on in Europe and the world and Putin and all that. He, he laid it out for us in his press conference. Unfortunate thing about Biden is this man reminds me of Beowulf in his last fight with Grendel in, in the great epic. Um, he can't give up the fight. He can't give up the sword, but he is incapacitated and he is weakened and sick. He was just diagnosed with COVID. Um, and, and the problem is that this is all of these factors are coming together, the attempted assassination, the incapacitation of the Democratic nominee, uh, Trump's genius for charismatic power and ability to, uh, to basically exploit the moment. And should we believe that he's had a metanoia, a turning, uh, that, that, you know, God intervened with him? Well, that's going to work with a lot of people, but those who know a little bit more about what's happened in the past and can see the parallels are not going to be fooled by that. No, but uh, a lot of people will be fooled by it. And when you say um, there are three F's in the, in the mantra now, fight, 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 uh, you're saying something like uh, what he said in front of the Capitol, um, you know, we've got to fight like hell, end quote, uh, at the insurrection. And so this is a, um, a, a continuation, if you will, or likely a continuation of the insurrection. When you say fight, 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 it's violence. So what, you know, as, a, as a, a fascist, as somebody who's trying to take all power, what does that mean? How will that you know, come about? He's got a lot of people. That convention had a lot of people screaming um, his praises. It's just unbelievable how many I guess everybody gotten on the bandwagon now without thinking about it. Uh, what does fight, fight, fight mean for them and for the country? Well, Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, it comes across as a really nice guy, is um, a very um, orthodox uh, Christian nationalist. Uh, he believes in dominionism. Dominionism has been grooming politicians and law students and judges for many, many years since it appeared on the scene. It's a, a kind of an alternative religion uh, by, started out by a guy named Rush Dooney. It's called Christian Reconstructionism. It's kind of an offshoot of the Presbyterian Church, but it's a much different offshoot. And basically they believe, as uh, Mike Johnson said in his address to the convention a few days ago, it is God who is the source of our laws. It is God who holds us. And um, that's his belief, that at the top of the pyramid is God, not the Constitution. Uh, he will give lip service to the Constitution. He will see the Constitution operating um, under the uh, so-called uh, American founding tradition. 
um, as an avatar for God, that it will be the Bible that really, really rules. You have to know how to hear these guys when they talk and how to um, assess them when their presentation of self is so mild-mannered. You know, it was the great scholar of fascism, Hannah Arendt, who came up with the phrase, the banality of evil. And she came up with this phrase after attending uh, six weeks of the trial of Adolf Eichmann. And uh, the man who exterminated was responsible for the extermination of the Jews in the concentration camps along with Heinrich Himmler. And she, the banality of evil means it appears mild and commonplace. You take these individuals out of their roles as killers, and they're like anybody else. They're not like the normal criminal who will go out and create mayhem. They're fathers like Rudolf Hess, whose family lived next door to Auschwitz that he was in charge of and never knew what was going on. His kids didn't know that he was a killer. And, and it, people like Adolf Eichmann, who when he was captured, by the Israeli um, Mossad in Argentina, followed all their orders too, because that's what he done. He follows orders. So you see, the banality of evil is occurring when you see when you when you study a fascist uh, movement, like like I've been studying here in the United States for a number of years, and you see the banality of it all. You see somebody like Johnson get up there. And, and this nice guy saying these mild things, and you know better. Well, let me go back to religion. So in this country, and it, it goes back a long way, um, we have this religious bent. Despite the First Amendment, we are ignoring the First Amendment and many other provisions of the Constitution, but we, we are re, you know, ignoring the, the founders' separation of church and state. Um, and that somehow feeds into everything you've been saying. But... What about Europe? What about Putin? Is there religion there? Um, is religion part of the gathering storm in Europe? Is it part of the hybrid war? Is it part of the, the move to the right, the autocracy and the fascism that we see? It is with Putin. Putin has returned uh, the Orthodox Church to a position of political power and also is um, guiding the narrative. He has a new order, but the order follows the lines of the Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox Church. In fact, the Russian Orthodox Church is such a player in Putin's vision of uh, what Russia will become and how its civilization will dominate Europe, um, that the Ukrainian Church, uh, which is Greek Orthodox, basically also uh, broke off from the Russian Orthodox Church. And, uh, and has its own administration now because it recognizes that the Russian Orthodox um, leaders are in line with what Putin wants. So yes, and they've banned Jehovah's Witnesses. They have banned alternative uh, missionaries in Russia. There's only one way and it's my way or the highway. The thing about fascism is so comfortable to people because it, it's very decisive, it's very active. Uh, but they set up a whole panoply of what the real targets are, what, what the evils are. For example, um, the Republican Party as it exists today, as MAGA, is setting up uh, immigration and immigrants as, uh, as the reason for America's troubles. And uh, you, you, those that are outliers who aren't part of the inner circle, who don't cave or uh, who don't join, uh, those are the ones that uh, are evil and humanized, dehumanized and targeted. Uh, every uh, fascist group, though, has a, has a comfort zone because it creates more community, more binding. Um, it creates a common vision. It has its own morality. There is something called the morality of terrorism, by the way, whether it's state or asymmetric, that rules to live by, but it generally overturns the, the, the consensus of what is moral and ethical that existed prior to it. That's really, really important for them to do. So violence can be, you know, a provocation. Violence can be a tool. It can be um, a weapon for a response. And we know that uh, in some cases, Putin has done provocative things and then responded to his own provocation um, in order to, you know, gain power. Um, and here we have, uh, you know, Trump, who was um, 
you know, the legitimate victim of the shooter. But on the other hand, as you said, you know, he was he had the, the awareness of um, what he could do with that and use it as a weapon. And almost immediately he stood up and shook his fist and and made a weapon out of the fact that he'd been attacked. But it doesn't end there, does it, Gene? I mean, we we will have more response. He will use this to the max. He will make himself not only a victim, but an avenger. He talked of a vengeance before. Now he has a, a greater reason. And he will attack his enemies on the basis of what happened uh, last weekend. Um, and there will be violence. And the problem that I see is that his supporters are the ones with the Second Amendment guns. And if you meet somebody in the street and they have an assault weapon and you don't, you're going to agree with them. Um, so we could have um, a kind of um, vengeance violence on the streets, not only assassinations and disappearances that do not appear in the press, that do not appear in an intimidated media. Um, we, we could have violence in the streets based on his acolytes who have the weapons. No? You know, if you have read the literature, the radical right in America prior to Trump or MAGA coming on the scene, I'm talking about violent organizations like the Order and Aryan Nation uh, who were attacking police back in the 1990s and the FBI um, and robbing Brinks trucks and assassinating talk show hosts. Uh, this insurrection, this low level insurrection that most Americans were unaware of I was studying at the time, along with my fellow scholars. And this uh, morphed, of course, into the movements like Proud Boys and Oath Keepers and uh, Three Percenters and the people that are behind the January 6th. And now it's it's become a popular front with the whole MAGA movement. Um, there, You can connect all these dots. Um, the problem is that um, the Second Amendment is holy script, holy writ for um, a fascist movement. Um, you have to have weapons in the hands of the right people. And that's what uh, why uh, they will not ban assault weapons because they wanna be the ones to hold them. It, 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 an iconic example of that would be Kyle Rittenhauser. Do you remember that young man? He's now going around as a hero of uh, the extreme right, the alt-right and talking to young people all over the country and to police groups and recruiting, because what did he do? He was a young teenager and he, he went to a protest, which got out of hand. Protests always get out of hand, by the way, even though people may start them or peaceful. Generally speaking, you, you, don't, you, you draw in those that are troublesome and want problems. And he went with a contingent of men with rifles, ostensibly to help the police and the police stood aside and let them help. And that help was the fact that he, he killed two people, uh, people who didn't deserve to be killed. Uh, and yet he took an assault rifle, killed two people in that context. And he is a hero for uh, this group of people behind the popular front of MAGA. But this young man, this lone wolf, who tried to assassinate Trump, probably for no real political reason that we know of, um, He's, he's a goat, he's, he's a villain. Uh, but they both had access to assault rifles. They were both very young. They were both in some respects trying to be heroic in their own minds. So you see, it all depends on how you look at things. Yeah. Well, it, what, you know, this is a hard question, but knowing that there's a, a fascism afoot knowing that there's a gathering storm, not only in Europe, but here, uh, knowing what um, Trump has in mind with his, uh, what is it, uh, Project 25, um, you know, what, what can the average individual do? I'm, I'm bypassing the question about what can the Democratic Party do, because I, I, I don't think they're capable of, you know, settling their plan. Um, but what, what can the average person do? Is, you know, in the old days, you would say, well, you have to vote for the right candidate. Well, thanks very much, but that doesn't mean a whole lot in this, you know, complex environment that we're talking about. Uh, I, I, su I suggest to Eugene that we are in a time 
when the average person can't do anything. Now, I know that Tim Snyder would not necessarily agree with that. Um, but what do you think? I, I'm pretty much in lockstep with Tim Snyder. I think he's the most informative person we've got on the scene. And we should be listening to him and reading his books more. Um, you know, Jay, when a catastrophe happens, it happens because not just one thing, but many things have to go wrong almost simultaneously. Some of those things can be put in motion intentionally and others have to just happen. Whenever a plane crashes, there's gonna be more than one thing wrong. Um, the pilots wouldn't be properly trained. Uh, there was a mechanical failure. The override system didn't work. Uh, there was bad weather. Everything has to happen all at once. And what we're seeing right now is a concatenation, an intersectionality of events that are both random and planned that are um, advantaging the MAGA movement. I won't even call it the GOP party anymore, the MAGA movement. And uh, you know what can we do? Well, there is such a tradition as resistance and there are factors that play into that. And if ever a time called for resistance, it might be now. First and foremost, should Trump get into power, the big number one question is going to be, is the media going to fail? Is the mainstream media going to go out of business? Is it going to feel the pressures? Are reporters going to be attacked? They are being attacked right now. They're being doxxed and harassed and, uh, and, and threatened. But is, is it going to be serious? Are, are the big time organs of objective information going to fold? That's number one. Number two, what will the military do? Which way will the military uh, move? You know, Hitler had his own army. Uh, when he achieved power in 1933, Ernst Strong, um, his sidekick, had a, a very, very large private army. But Hitler, uh, thinking ahead, wanting to assume control over the state and the population, even though he only had a minority following at the time. Um, they had the Night of the Long Knives when he called upon the German military and uh, they made a pact with him and they assassinated Rom and, uh, and basically took over his army, killed those that uh, were in positions of power. And, uh, and and incorporated uh, the the, the <laughs> Rome's army into the German military, and the German military supported Hitler. And from then on, the, you see, the military in Germany was a little different from ours. I'm not making real comparisons here because the state army in that time was much weaker than our army is. But what are our armed forces going to do? We know that during the first Trump administration, when Trump wanted uh, the United States military to step in and uh, shoot at protesters in front of the White House. Um, the, the generals said no, but he said he's not going to make that mistake again. He's only going to have people around him who agree with him. And I believe that. I mean, look who we chose, J.D. Vance. Um, but <laughs> if, if the military falls into line or the police departments fall into line, then we're cooked. <laughs> yeah that's the baby the media yeah. and the police and the, and the military these are organs of power and mindset you can change the mindset hitler set up a propaganda ministry under goebbels right away and and they went about it scientifically we have a manual from this guy named hadamovsky who enacted what goebbels wanted him to do propaganda wise in the beginning the german people weren't interested in killing jews they were only interested in having their pocketbooks filled because they wanted somebody who could make bring Germany back to some semblance of order during the Great Depression and after a big defeat. But, uh, and they weren't interested in oppressing Jews. But by the time uh, Hitler went out of power, he had convinced a lot of the people in Germany that the Jews were the problem. And right now we're getting that with the immigrants, you see. Immigrants are the problem. It's always gotta be some group that's gonna be the problem. Well, back to your thought about the media for a moment. Um, the media had been criticizing him and he's been threatening them and, and uh, you know, doing 
lots of threatening things to individual members of the media. Just him, uh, but the uh, whole convention is criticizing the media. Yeah, uh, well, as well as their 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 corporate leadership, um, and um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that on his list of uh, vengeance is uh, you know the large news organizations that tell the truth or at least try to. Uh, for example, the New York Times, the Washington Post, what have you, MSNBC is a good example. And if he gets into power, he has the power, I think that's clear, um, to stop them, put them out of business, sue them, God knows what, uh, so that they are no longer a threat. And if that happens, I really like your reaction to this, if that happens, all the things you've described, all the parallels to the 30s and all that, um, are much more threatening because we won't know, because the the information uh, that we get will be propaganda off state media, just like Russian TV right now. We will not know what's happening, um, and we, we really must rely on on these independent uh, sources of media. Uh, what can we do to protect them? Um, they will be a target for sure. On Wikipedia. Uh, has become kind of a um, uh, a general commonplace uh, um, organ of information. Um, anything that doesn't conform to quote alternative facts that the regime wants people to believe and the one narrative that is uh, acceptable, uh, they will go after anybody who contradicts that. So you have situations in the extreme case, for example, in Russia, where of course journalists are being targeted, they're being killed, uh, they have been killed. And um, anybody who exposes uh, the corruption of the regime, like Navalny and his movement will be targeted. Now his wife has been targeted. Um, so that's the situation. And nevertheless, up until the very last days of Germany, there were revolts and thoughts. Uh, Klaus von Stauffenberg uh, was a German Prussian officer high up in the, uh, in the military and very revered. And he conceived of a bomb plot to bomb Hitler at Wolf's Lair with his advisors. He actually, the bomb went off. Hitler was wounded, he was not killed. And, uh, and others were killed. And von Stauffenberg was, of course, executed along with everybody that they could put their hands on that knew him. Um, but that was right up until the end. The problem with this type of violent response and with assassination is that they have unintended consequences, which can be even worse. After von Stauffenberg's plot was spoiled for the end of the war, instead of in essence, conceding defeat, what did Hitler do? He took the youngest boys and the oldest men and demanded that they defend Germany, and many of them were killed uh, in senseless battles for Berlin and, and the rest of Germany. He, um, he basically told the German people, you have to resist and commit suicide. Um, and he did commit suicide. Uh, so a lot of people were needlessly killed at the end, and he tried to exterminate all of the people that were in the concentration camps by sending them on forced marches and leaving them in a band. These are things that, unfortunately, we accused Japan and their warlords of saying that the Japanese people from child to elderly are going to resist any kind of invasion, and that was a wake-up call for us, but we... we, we forget that that same thing happened in Germany. And a lot of it was a response to Hitler's paranoia. And the von, uh, von Stauffenberg plot isn't responsible for that, but it's an example of how an attempt to ameliorate a situation by killing leaders can really go awry. Assassinations start wars. We know this from World War I. It was started by an assassination. Assassinations can change um, the world. We know that the, the Kennedy administration ultimately his assassination put Nixon in power. Um, Vietnam went south. There's any number of bad things that can happen. Well, you know, I keep thinking of the old mantra about how power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. 
um, as a, a sort of a cycle. And in a sense, we're looking at that right now. But we're out of time. We're, mm -hmm. we're not out of the discussion. We have miles to go before we stop. Um, but we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Gene Rosenfeld.